Uh, so today's topic is, is purgatory. And I, uh, it's, it's a topic very often very misunderstood. And, uh, and so it's, it's good to understand how important purgatory is and our responsibility as well. Because at the end of this, we should understand, and that's my whole idea of having this uh, session, is our understanding of the responsibility we have because of purgatory. And if purgatory was not there, there was a responsibility that would have been a little less for us. But now we are going to have a responsibility that is, that is really, really great. And it's very important as well. And to get rid of an attitude of purgatory that, that can be very negative. Because generally, if I ask you how many of you would like to go to purgatory? All those who would like to go to purgatory? Yeah, your next option is hell. <laughs> well, you're thinking of the heaven part of it. <laughs> the heaven part of it, by the time we come into the second part of this talk, or the second point of this talk, we'll see how much we're getting there. And, and how important, and that is why, how important purgatory is. It's, it's a concept that is, that is very often had a very big division, especially amongst the Catholics and the Protestants. And because according to them, the concept is either you're just going to hell or you're going to heaven. There are only those two things. If Jesus has saved you, Jesus has saved you. And so why do we need purgatory? So what's that whole idea and concept of purgatory? And, and it, can, it can always be connected to, and there's been depictions of purgatory depicted as this place where there's fire. And how many of us like fire? No, we don't like fire, especially in Australia. We, we just don't like fires. So uh, it's, it's very often connected to that fire, and it's something that we are we always terribly scared about. Um, when I was doing my philosophy, we had uh, our rector, Father George, and uh, a wonderful man of God. But one of his punishments that he would give us if we did something wrong was to kneel down. Now, your laughing is because you know, it's a bit childish. Yeah. We are, we're, we're studying philosophy. And you know, you've already finished around three and four years of your seminary studies. You're supposed to have reached a, a kind of a, a, a maturity in your spiritual journey, in your, seminar, in your seminary life. And making brothers kneel at that stage is actually a bit childish. And, uh, and that became a controversy even in our, in our congregation, it became a controversy. Don't be bothered by him. He's, he's making me a star. So let's change it around. And oh, by the way, we had a very dramatic start. Um, you know, in, in India, we would say that, uh, I don't know, in Kerala, we basically would say, you know, basically, it means that uh, you look at something, look at something, and then uh, how would you translate that? Any other Malayalis can translate that for me? I don't know. But, Yes, you know, eyes. The, someone set eyes on you and evil eye, cast an evil eye. Paulita, I don't think you want to go home and rewind and hear your, your praise and worship because we changed your voice into a male voice. We have no clue how that happened. <laughs> we had to restart the computer because the computer just did it by itself. So till now, there's been nothing wrong and then it just comes up. So... Um, this this uh, rector would actually ask us to kneel down. Now, it became a controversy within the congregation as well. They were not very happy. They'd say, you know, they are brothers, brothers so, who are mature. Why are you making them kneel down? And um, not many liked it. Some of the brothers didn't like it as well. But I have to be different, so I loved it. I loved kneeling down is because I knew with that punishment... I was then right with him. It ended with that. You know, if you have rectors who kind of just watch you and see, okay, this is what you've done, they'll say a word or they might get angry with you, and then you don't know if it'll come in the, into the report. It doesn't end there. There will be consequences afterwards. While when it comes to uh, Father George, I was so sure every time I make a mistake and he asks me to kneel, I was happy because I knew it ended with that. 
Now, many of the others didn't understand that. And as long as they didn't understand it, they were not happy about it. You know, they kept complaining that, that uh, father is doing things to the brothers that he shouldn't do. When people don't understand something, or they misunderstand something, it can kind of live a lifetime with them. And I think that's the problem with purgatory as well. Purgatory for us is this, this place of torment. You know, we will be tormented, 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 and at the end of it, and then, okay, now you can get in. And you kind of think, who wants to get in after that? You know, you're, you're so tormented. So this whole concept of, of purgatory can be very disturbing. So let's just understand what the church means by purgatory and why the scriptures speak about purgatory as well and how important it is for the church why it is important for the church and what the church can do through it. Um, I have a few papers today. Today is, not, uh, today is not a day I can do very, very well offhand. But I'm going to read from the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, what it speaks about purgatory in 1030. 1030 is not time, it's the paragraph. So they have uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church. You know how it goes, right? You don't know how it goes, does it? <laughs> So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, your, everything is based on, on the paragraphs. There, there are, it's based on chapters as well, but, but you'll always have everything is written as a continuous um, as paragraph. So each point is there, has a paragraph. So if you go into 1030, that's 1030, it says, All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of eternal salvation. Sounds good? Very good. But after death, they undergo purification. Sounds good? Good. So as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Sounds good. Yes. So see? The church didn't tell us anything about torment. But there's a little catch in that. But after death, they undergo purification. So in 1031, it would say, the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification. I want you to remember this, the final purification. So if there's a final purification, it means? It means? You've come back after so long, you have to speak. You've forgotten how to speak. <laughs> now, we've been having problems with, uh, with some of the families telling us about their little kids who, are, who have uh, not, not even going to school, and they are struggling because the children are now not socially um, able to convey or communicate with people, you know, because they've been just at home and, and not seeing people. So you better come out of it very soon. <laughs> uh, uh, your, your voice should be heard. So. The church uh, gives the name purgatory to this final purification. If it's final, that means what's there? It means there's something before it. Now, first, second, third, fourth, whatever it is, but there's something before it. So this is the final purification, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Yeah. So um, one, be sure there is a hell. Okay, there is a hell. And there is a heaven. And then there is this purgatory. And we'll understand why we need that purgatory as well. It is entirely different from, from the punishment of the damned. But it is a purification. Okay? And so it speaks about, it, it takes reference, the church formulates all its references from the councils of Florence and the council of Trent, according to the tradition of the church and according to the scripture, speaking of a cleansing fire, purification by, by fire. How many of you like fire? You still don't like fire. Okay. Now that's where our problem is, that we still don't like that fire. And there is a huge difference between the fire of hell and the fire of purgatory. So the fire of hell comes from the evil one, the fire of purgatory comes from God, is God. Now, how many of you like fire? Okay, at least some difference. Okay. 
So now what it goes on to say is that as for certain lesser faults, we must, we must believe before the final judgment that there is purifying fire. For certain lesser faults, there is a purifying fire. He who is truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor in the age to come. Now, this is from Matthew chapter 12, verse 32 and 33. I'm sorry, we don't have it for you. Uh, if you had sat at home, <laughs> you'd have got the scripture verse better. Um, we are still getting our, our projectors. If any of you know anyone who is professional in installing projectors, I would really like to know because we really need to install our projectors. If anybody who is watching an online stream and uh, you're professional in, in installing projectors, please let me know. I'm, I'm running around to find someone. Not just someone. I'm someone who knows how to do it. Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verse 32 and 33 speaks about the sin against the Holy Spirit. What does it say? Matthew 12, 32 and 33. Whoever speaks... A word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age nor in the age to come. Now, I'm not going to be speaking about that sin against the Holy Spirit. That is not my topic. Okay, we will have that topic another day. But this gives a huge clue about an age to come. So there are certain sins that will be forgiven in this age. The sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven even in this age and in the age to come. What is that age to come? Because if, if there is only heaven and hell, then once, it is, once we are in heaven, then we don't this sin will not be forgiven in heaven. But you cannot have an unforgiven sin in heaven. Yeah, so you get hell then. <laughs> so there, there's, a, there's a problem with just the fact that that means you're going to hell. So it's speaking about, as the church would tell us in the catechism, it's speaking about this period of purification for our temporal sins. The purification for our temporal sins. Not our mortal sins. Our mortal sins, the sins that we are confessing is getting washed away. There's always a consequence of sins. There's always a consequence of sins. And so this consequence of sin, there's a temporal punishment connected to that sin. And so there has to be a purification for that speaks about this age to come. That means there is going to be a time in which certain things are going to be purified. Certain sins need to be purified at that stage. Take Matthew 5, verse 23. I suppose none of you have come here with your Bibles? No, okay, it's okay. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. It speaks about the famous... Uh, um, a famous uh, scripture verse on, on anger and unforgiveness. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. Go first, be reconciled to your brother, your sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison and in verse 26, truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Until you have paid the last penny. So we're going to put the two together. That is the age to come and the last penny. We have two church fathers, Tertullian and um, and Cyprian, who make a reference to this last penny. Cyprian brings it out very beautifully when he speaks of the martyrs. Martyrs, have they gone to heaven? Yes. Say yes, that's the teaching of the church. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so the martyrs have gone to heaven. So Cyprian now makes a distinction and he says, some are martyrs courageous enough to give their 
life for God. But there are also those who are one with the church who were not courageous to give their life for God or you know, die for Christ. Where are they? So the martyrs went to heaven. The ones who didn't give their life, should they go to hell? You better be very careful with that because you, you and I might be in that boat. <laughs> you and I might really, really be in that boat. So uh, Cyprian makes this distinction and he says, the definite salvation of the martyrs, but for those who did not have the courage for it, but had communion with the church. They were one with the church. They had one with the thought of the church as well. Had to go through a purification process, which he would say to give the last penny. Now they can't give that last penny. They're not able to give that last penny because they are in? They're in prison. Okay, according to this scriptural verse. Okay, I'm taking the context. So, um, they are in prison, and therefore, they cannot give the last penny. So the penny has to come from somewhere. Yes, the penny has to come from somewhere. So first, so I'm just dividing this, this talk into four, four parts. The first one is, is there purgatory and what it is? So is there purgatory? Yes, there is a purgatory. It speaks about a place, an age to come. It speaks about this last penny that needs to be offered so that the soul can find its deliverance and its union with God in that beatific vision. Now, is this, uh, is this a particular place? Is purgatory a place or is purgatory a space? Don't give an answer because there are different theologies that will actually give you different un understandings for it. If it is a place or if it is a space, a situation of purgatory. So I would rather call it a situation of purgatory. A situation of purgatory. There are um, Cardinal, I actually did a, I actually did a, I had to submit a paperwork in connection to the topic of purgatory when I was doing my master's. And uh, so I took a comparative study of the different theologies. And uh, one of those who I took was Cardinal Ratzinger. And what his idea of purgatory is beautiful, his idea of purgatory. And the different theologies as well, which doesn't actually contradict the church's understanding, but Cardinal Ratzinger gives a very clear, definitive idea about uh, what, or, or what we are supposed to expect in purgatory. And in that, he speaks of it as being a space, not a place. Now, there are different, even, even uh, St. John Paul II speaks about it as being a space, more a metaphysical uh, reality. So something beyond just what we understand in our world today. But irrespective of that, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger speaks. When I say Cardinal Ratzinger, it's because he was cardinal at that time when he actually wrote this uh, um, whole uh, treatise as well. So when he spoke, he, he refers to an apocryphal book called The Life of Adam and Eve in which Seth, who is Seth? Who said Seth, Seth? Really, Seth? son of Adam and Eve. So Seth is feeling very sad after the death of Adam. And he's scared about how, what, what would Adam's state be? Because Adam had committed sin. So what would Adam's state be? And he's assured that Adam will be filled with God's mercy, but will have to undergo a penalty for a period of time. Now that penalty the church speaks about is a purification process. So do we have purgatory? Yes, we have purgatory. There's a space that, or a situation of purgatory that is there that needs to be addressed, that needs to be understood, that needs to be believed in. And why? This is what we will, we will understand. You know, when, when we are on this earth, we keep sinning. We go to confession, we sin. We go to confession, we sin. We go to confession, we sin. But Every day we are with this battle of sin. There's always a battle with sin. We are working on it. But ultimately, once we pass away, something or the other remains. Yes or no? Yes. Most probably something or the other remains. For those who nothing remains, they are called 
they're called saints, where there is no sin in them at all. Mortal, venial, nothing. No sin, the purest form of a soul. But the others, there will always be something remaining. I remember when I used to do, uh, I used to do gardening, not, the very little gardening that I used to do at, at home, and, and we, used to, we used to try and clean up. You know, if there's a plant there, you clean up around the plant. So we take the spade and we are cleaning up around the plant. And sometimes you'll see that someone comes and puts something into it. And then it irritates you because you have to do it all over again. And they have to do it all over again. And then you're waiting. Can you just stop what you want to put so that I can actually get my work done? And that is how purgatory is. Life has stopped. Can you sin anymore? After death, can you sin anymore? You can't sin anymore. Now is the final purification. Before that, and that is why Cardinal Ratzinger would say, the first purification is... The first purification is baptism. So from that time onwards, the purification process has already begun. So every time the church gives a penance in the confessional, that is a part of the purification process. So don't think this penance, ah, just Hail Mary, will agree, Lord, be thee, blessed are three Hail Marys. He gives me three Hail Marys every time, that's it. And there's no big difference. There is, there's a meaning in that penance as well. It is a part of the purification process that we are going through. And that is why purgatory is called the final purification. Now there's no more sins that we can accumulate anymore. Now whatever remains, which has not been confessed, all that has not been confessed, all the sins that may be from our last confession, our last sincere confession, till the time of our death, Whatever sins remain, any kind of impurity, any kind of impurity is now being purified in that phase of purgatory. What is it being purified by? Fulton Sheen describes this beautifully when he says, purgatory is where the love of God tempers the justice of God, the love of God tempers the justice of God and the love of man tempers the injustice of man. The love of God tempers the justice of God. Should the love of God temper the justice of God? <coughs> Did you understand the concept? Yes. If the love of God does not temper the justice of God, then it is the justice of God we will have to face. Anyone with any sin in front of the justice of God will not have any hope. And so he so beautifully says, the love of God tempers the justice of God. It has to. It has to in purgatory. The love of God has to temper the justice of God. And that is where we are being molded, in that love of God. And that love of God is what the church calls as the purifying fire. And that is the fire that is connected to purgatory. It is the blazing love of God. That is the only way we can be purified, by that blazing love of God. Because there is always the justice of God. We cannot deny that there's the justice of God. We cannot say that God will forget justice. No. Even when the Lord spoke to St. Faustina, when he speaks about his mercy, what does he tell St. Faustina? Tell the people to come to the font of my mercy, if they don't come to the font of my mercy, then they will have to come and stand in front of my, my justice. And the Lord himself is telling us, I'm telling you, don't come and stand in front of my, my justice. So in purgatory, we are being purified by that love. And that is what First Corinthians, what we read just now, uh, First Corinthians 
chapter, sorry, chapter 3, 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 10 to 15. 1 Corinthians, chapter 10. Sorry, 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. According to the grace given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is the foundation of Christ. You have to lay your foundation of Christ. And then, because it will be revealed, what will be revealed on what you've built on? Gold, silver, hay, uh, wood, straw, it will all be revealed. How? It will pass through the fire. Which fire? The purifying fire. It will pass through the purifying fire and everything will be revealed. All that has been, has been built on wood, hay, and straw, that will all burn off. It ends with this verse, if what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. Those are the, those are the saints. Okay. If the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer a loss. Okay, it will suffer a, the builder will suffer a loss. But the builder will be saved. How? Through that fire itself. So the fire that reveals the reality, now that fire also will save. Why? Because that fire is, it is that blazing love of God. It is a blazing love of God. Where the love of God is, there is always hope. There is always hope. Now why, why do we need, why do we need to go through that purgatory? The book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 22 onwards speaks. Revelation, chapter 21, Verses 22 onwards. It's speaking about the new Jerusalem. I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no sun or moon to shine on it. Or for the glory of God. For the glory of God is its light and its Lamb is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day. There will be no night over there. Everything will be God's glory. What is this description about? Heaven. It's about heaven. The description, the new Jerusalem is the heaven. It will be pure. It will be holy. There will be no night. There will be no darkness. And in verse 27 it says, But nothing unclean will enter into it. Nothing unclean will enter into it. So if nothing unclean is allowed to enter into it, as we would read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, it says, sinners will not enter into the kingdom of God. Sinners will not enter into the kingdom of God. So can sin be within the kingdom? So sin cannot be within the kingdom. So that means if there are, there are those sins that still need to be purified, those temporal punishments that need to be experienced because of the sins that were committed, it needs to be purified. Only then can that soul enter into the into the kingdom of God. Because in the kingdom of God, there is no impurity. You cannot have impurity in God's kingdom. As we would read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and of spirit making holiness perfect in the fear of the Lord. Making holiness perfect. 
You remember a couple of times Jesus saying, be holy as my heavenly father is holy. Be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. We brush it aside and we say, how can we become perfect? But if we are not perfect, we cannot enter into perfection. When you have something pure, you will not mix something impure into it. You cannot. When we were in the seminary, I was doing my theology with the Salesians, and and, um, uh, we used to have big beehives, not something we made, but the bees used to just come uh, underneath the sunshades. Uh, Do you have sunshades here? No. Uh, you, you have the windows. In India, you have the windows, and, and uh, we'll, we'll have a little extension over that window because it's all made of uh, uh, concrete. And under that, if you don't open these windows regularly, the bees used to come and make these huge beehives. And the brothers could not get access to it anyway, but it was filled with bees. So once there was this um, um, hippies. I, I, don't, I don't think we can call them hippies. They are they're basically people who move from place to place. I, I, don't, I don't even want to call them vagabonds. <laughs> gypsies, OK, yeah, maybe yes, gypsies. So uh, but in India, you actually don't call them gypsies. They are actually belonging to a tribe. So uh, they just move from place to place. So they came, and they told uh, our rector, you know, there's, uh, there's nearly 10 of them. We'll cut, and we will take. And we will give you all a portion. And the brothers can buy as well, if they want to buy. We're all very excited. But they said, where we are doing our work, you should not come and disturb us. We said, fine. We all waited very patiently. They, they cut it very dramatic to see it. You know, they, would, they would be hanging by, by one hand on that little parapet. And one hand slips, and they just fall down. And then they'd be cutting the, cutting the beehive from one side, and all the bees swarming around them. And then they tie a rope around it, and they pull it up to the terrace. And on the terrace, they are collecting all these hives. And then they are squeezing out the, the honey, and they are putting it into that um, big jar. And then they started bottling it. And then one of them will come down, and he gives, starts selling it to the brothers. And the brothers were very happy. <laughs> They're getting high honey, you know, this big bottles of honey. It was just barely around 50 rupees or so. It would be $1 over here, big bottles of honey, fresh honey over there. And we were all so excited. Many of us bought. We put it into our rooms. And one of our brothers started tasting it. And he said, this is rubbish. <laughs> he said, this is not pure honey. These chaps are mixing jaggery and, and sugar <laughs> on the top. And this brother knew it is because in his house in Kerala, in the high ranges, they actually have, uh, they, they do this, uh, they do the business of beehives and, and um, honey. And he knows what perfect honey is. He said, this is not perfect honey. This is all mixed up. He said, and he said, he just couldn't, he, you know, he couldn't taste it. He just didn't like it. But honestly, I drank the whole thing. <laughs> I'm the kind who likes a Cadbury chocolate more than you give me a Swiss chocolate. And anyone knows that the Swiss chocolate will have more purity of, of, uh, uh, of chocolate in it than Cadbury's. Cadbury's has more sugar than, than chocolate in it. But for me, it was perfectly fine. You know, I don't mind. I, I don't, I've never drunk so much of honey. I was so happy. It was in my room every day. I take and drink. That brother didn't even touch it. For a person who doesn't know, it doesn't matter. A person who tastes exquisite wine will not be able to taste rubbish. You know, they, they make out the difference. You, know, you give me, I'll never know the difference at all. I don't drink wine. Uh, uh, I drink the blood of Christ, but I don't drink wine. Never, never tell anyone that the priests drink wine as well at the Eucharist. It's a sacrilege if you say that. That means you don't even believe that that's the blood of Jesus. So, um, so the only thing uh, I drink, I drink the blood of Christ. But other than that, I don't drink wine. So I'd have no clue about wine. But a person who, who drinks exquisite wine knows when there's something not good enough. Now, that's the same. For us, we might think, you know, it's a small sin. What's there? 
No, let him, let him enter, let us enter into the kingdom of God. Let him uh, be merciful and kind and loving and let him just, uh, let us have that union with him in heaven. It is not possible, not even for the Lord is that possible because he is purity. Into purity, impurity cannot exist. The moment impurity comes into purity, what happens? What happens? The pure becomes impure. The pure is no more pure. And can you imagine God being impure? Then how can we tell the Lord, Lord, just accept? It's a small little sin here and there. That has to be purified. This is why we need purgatory. Because we need to be purified to fit in. As, as Cardinal Ratzinger would say, so that that burning fire, the purifying fire of the love of God melts us and then makes us fit in. Melts us and then makes us fit in. Uh, uh, have, you, have you seen diamonds, raw diamonds, South Africans? No? You all should know better. <laughs> so a raw diamond, you'll get it on eBay. You know that? You just check eBay. You'll get raw diamonds on eBay as well. It's a, it's a lot of money, but still. And it looks terrible. Will any of you ladies over here, I, I don't think the gents, you, you interested in diamonds? No. <laughs> to wear? No, I don't think so. So the, the ladies, you like diamonds? How many of you like diamonds? I might be distributing some at the end. <laughs> High hopes from the priest. <laughs> You like diamonds, but if I give you a raw diamond, will you put that on your... Okay, f forget about me. You, me, you'll take anything from. <laughs> your husband suddenly gives you wedding anniversary. My sweetheart. <laughs> you know how it is, right? The diamonds are between a rock. And, and my sweetheart, this is what I got for you. Is this what you got for me? <laughs> this nonsense. It's a rock. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's just a rock. You, you, you wouldn't, for that diamond to make meaning and to have value, it has to be purified, 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 smoothened, and cleansed. And that is why, you know, there's this, this is beautiful verse in, in uh, Lamentations chapter 4, verse 1. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 1. It says, oh, I'm always out of time. Um, Lamentations 4, verse 1. How the gold has grown dim. How the pure gold has changed. The sacred stones lie scattered at the head of every street. What are you and me? We are built in the image and likeness of God. That is what we are. That diamond is there within. It's just that a lot of that rock also is there. That needs to be purified. You and I in the image and likeness of God. When God sees us, that is what he sees. He sees that, that, that diamond that we are. He sees that gold that we are. He sees that purity, the potential of that purity that is there within us. And therefore, for God, it is imperative. It is so important that everything that spoils the beauty of that diamond needs to be shed. It needs to be taken off because within us, we have the presence of God. Within us, we have that union with God. Within us, we have the holiness of God. But somewhere, that little impurity here and there needs to be purified. And that is why the, the purifying fire, and that is why um, Bishop Fulton Sheen would say, the love of God tempers the, the justice of God. And that love starts purifying us. That is what the souls in purgatory are going through. They're going through that purifying fire of the love of God. And therefore, for them, we have to understand, for them, it is not a time of pain or sadness. For them, it is always a time of hope. And that is why you should never think of your loved ones in purgatory and say, I hope they are not in purgatory. I hope they are not suffering in purgatory. 
this whole idea about suffering in purgatory. I'll come to that just after this, this uh, second part of, of what, what we do as well. So first is the love, of, the love of God tempers the justice of God. And the second is the love of man tempers the injustice of man. That is the second part of it as to how and why we need to pray for the souls in purgatory. The love of man, if you're offended, woman also. The love of man and woman tempers the injustice. The sin that has been, that has been existent in, in what, the, or what those souls in purgatory have left behind. That's sin. So the love of man is now tempering the injustice of man. How? How do we pray for the souls in purgatory? Why can we pray for the souls in purgatory? Because of the union that we have with the, with the church. The union with the church. We are one with the, we are one with the church. And therefore, we read in Jude, in the book of Maccabees, chapter 2, sorry, 2 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, chapter 12. 2 Maccabees chapter 12 speaks about Judas Maccabees. This is from verse 39 to 45. Judas Maccabees, they've gone for war. After the war is over, there are many of their fellow soldiers who have fallen dead. They go and search and, and they're taking their dead. And underneath, um, when they start lifting their blankets, they start seeing amulets that have been put, offered to other gods. And they realize that a great sin has been committed. What does Judas Maccabees do? The word tells us that Judas Maccabees tells the people in verse 43, 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 43, he took up a collection man by man to the amount of 2,000 silver coins, a sin offering that was given and sent it to Jerusalem to offer it as a sin offering. It was given as an offering for the, for the dead. An offering that was given for the dead. Prayers were made for the dead. Today we pray for the souls in purgatory. Why? Because of our union with the, the church. All the souls in purgatory were in union with the, with the church. They were not people. The souls in purgatory are not people who have rejected God outright. The souls in purgatory are the souls that have the are undergoing the temporal punishments for their venial sins. And so they are one with the church. So the connection we have to the dead is through the union we have with the church. The church here is a militant church. The church in heaven is the triumphant church. And therefore the saints in heaven, how do we have communion with the saints in heaven? We are the one, we're the one church. So the church will always have the union with the dead because the church on earth and the church in heaven are connected. It's one. The church is always one. And therefore, when we pray for the dead, we are praying as one church because the church is making their journey together. Cardinal Ratzinger would speak about this and speak about the levels in which uh, the soul is getting purified. Each level in which the soul is getting purified. With each prayer, the church is journeying with the soul towards that purification. So the church doesn't leave any soul by itself to fend for itself. Every cry of the soul in purgatory is responded to by, by the church. By you and I. That is the church. That is why every time we pray... Every time we offer a mass, every time we do a good act, we are actually responding and we offer it up for the souls in purgatory. We are responding to the needs of the, of the soul in purgatory that's looking forward to its union in, in God. And that is why we pray along with the church. When we celebrate the sacrifice here, are you celebrating the sacrifice only over here? No. The church doesn't celebrate the sacrifice only over here. When we celebrate the sacrifice here, the church is celebrating the sacrifice 
along with the holy church all over the world, wherever the celebration of the sacrifice of the Eucharist is happening, it is happening as one. So the church is celebrating it all together. So every prayer you offer, every mass you offer, every act of charity you do, directed towards the soul in purgatory, is helping souls reach their union with God. That is our responsibility. That is the church's responsibility. So you cannot forget, we cannot forget the souls in purgatory. We cannot just remember our loved ones in purgatory. Are only your loved ones the, the church of God? No. As much as your loved ones are the church of God, even the ones you don't know are the church of God. Just look at the live streaming that we have. We have people from different countries. The last time I checked, nearly 50 countries. From 50 different countries, people were tuning in for the, for the mass. All from different places. We've not seen each other, different cultures, but still we call ourselves one church. For all the souls in purgatory, therefore the responsibility for us to pray for the souls in purgatory, not only for your loved ones. And that is why I told on, that, on the day we had the All Souls Day, I said one of the, one of the uh, major prayers we always get, mass intentions we always get is for the souls in purgatory. Not just for my loved one, my mother, my father. Apart from that, also for all souls in purgatory. Because we as a church together are praying. We are responsible to pray for all the souls in purgatory. Every day in your house, you should pray for the souls in purgatory. Every day. At one point, I know at the end of the rosary, especially in Kerala, at the end of the rosary, there would be this prayer for the souls in purgatory. Oh gosh, that was so painful. Because you're sitting through this rosary, first of all. When you're young and you're really doing it, you're waiting, when will this get over? And then suddenly they will say this, this uh, prayer for the souls in purgatory. And, and when, when we had an aunt who used to say it, she used to say it five times. And in Malayalam, it's longer, actually. In English, it's a very short one. In Malayalam, it's actually the, the first, uh, first verse is long and the response is long. And, and then it'll be five, five of them. And I think, oh, gosh. <laughs> How terrible, isn't it? How terrible it is that we, we think that this responsibility is not ours. It is ours. It's our church there. It's our people there. It's our brother, our sister there. Irrespective of if they were from our own family or no. If there are people across the world who can look and say, Oh, Father Michael, we like um, being a part of your mass. If I mean something to them over a, over a silly camera, how much more? The souls that have all come from God, a creation that has all come from God, you, 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 all come from God together. That union that we had with God when we were created. Now, this brother, this sister of mine is mine. They are not somebody else's mother. They're not somebody else's father. They're not somebody else's child. They are mine. When Jesus says that, when, when Peter asks him, what will we get? He said, you will get a hundredfold. You will get a hundredfold. I have many children. I have many children. Because you have children. And your children and, and all the souls in purgatory and every soul now is actually, they are part of my family. I cannot think that this is not my responsibility. And that is why it's very important for us to understand the responsibility we have towards all the souls in purgatory. Every day in your family, make that prayer. For the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. I don't know if you're... It's there in English. I know in Malayalam there is Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory be also after that. <laughs> That's five times. <laughs> That's halfway through another decade of the rosary. 
but it would happen every family because we have a responsibility towards the souls in purgatory. When we think of them, one thing we need to change is we need to change that attitude of the fear of purgatory because in purgatory, it's filled with the love of God. A purifying process is happening. Your loved ones, your fellow brothers, your fellow sisters are getting purified. The destination is sure. The destination is Christ. It is just how and when they're going to get there. How much will we give a hand for them to get there? How much does it matter to us that they get there soon? For them, there is there's supposed to be the purifying process. It is a painful process. The purification is a painful process. But why doesn't it pain them? Why are they not in pain in the situation of purgatory? Because they are being purified by the, the love of God. When they are being purified by the love of God, the pain that they are going through in the purification process suddenly is negligible. Because the love of God is now covering them. I remember one of my classmates who used to go to the hospital and had to have, have injections after he was bit by a dog. And, uh, they, they, were, they were not sure if, uh, here I don't know how many, in India it is 21 injections. For the rabies injection, 21 injections right near the navel. And, it's a, and earlier it used to be this very, very long needle that they used to push in. And we used to ask him, how do you get through it? You want to know what he said? He said, the nurse who gives me the injection is very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible thing to say during this service. Oh, the love of God is so beautiful. The love of God is so amazing that the purifying process they are going through and the pain of that purification does not come anywhere close. So your loved ones are not in pain. Your loved ones are being covered and purified in the purifying fire of the love of Christ. Don't sit and be in agony and be sad and think maybe they are suffering in purgatory. Get rid of that attitude. I've had people who have told me, I hope this is my purgatory because I'm suffering now. <laughs> so you already thought, you know, it's going to be a suffering place and terrible. I hope this is my purgatory. Stop saying that. I hope this is my purgatory. Here we are not filled with that blazing love of Jesus. In purgatory, you're filled with that blazing love of Christ. When you're filled with the blazing love of Christ, nothing else matters. You're in the anticipation of that union with God. My sister came last year, December, or around this time. I'm homesick now. Uh, <laughs> so when she came, uh, first time she and her daughter came here, and um, I couldn't go to the airport because I had to be here for that Saturday evening mass. And... Uh, so I had to send friends to pick them up. Now I knew, and I was so excited they were coming. My sister and me are very close. And uh, I was so excited that they were coming. And I'm, I'm waiting over here every, you know, I, I know that when they've left the airport there, she's messaged me. Uh, in transit, she's messaged me. I know she's coming, she's coming, she's coming. And I couldn't go for go to receive her. I wanted to be there, to be that first person to give her that hug. You know, I always see that in the, the airports over here. You know, you'll come holding that balloon and, and uh, you know, welcome back and those flowers and everything. Everyone's holding it. I've also desired, you know, I can also hold something, but I can't do it to every, every Tom, Dick and Harry around the place. The only person I could have given that major hug to was my sister. Now, I couldn't even go for it because I was at mass over here. So I'm waiting over here and that, that whole night before, I barely slept. I was so excited. She's coming. She's coming. You know, the, the whole moment. And every time I was here, I was in pain that I couldn't be there. But I'm still in that anticipation. I know that she's coming. It's, it's that kind of an anticipation. Just place yourself in one of those pictures of yourself. You're waiting and waiting, and that's what the souls in purgatory are waiting with that excitement. We will find our union. Their greatest pain is that they are not in union with God. That is their greatest pain. That is the pain in purgatory, that they are not in union with God. And their greatest joy is that they are covered with the love of God that's going to embrace them into himself. 
that love will melt them and fit them right in. And that's what we pray for. So during this, this time, there's a lot more things. I've just cut it off. I'm, I'm terribly late. But we're going to pray for all the souls in purgatory. We'll pray for our loved ones as well. You, are, you, are, you might be better off um, reading a bit more. On YouTube, you get some beautiful talks on, on purgatory as well. Please do take uh, um, uh, read or, or listen to those as well. It's beautiful understanding of why the church uh, understands purgatory and how the church understands purgatory because we have a responsibility every day to pray for all the souls in purgatory.